Welcome to the National Science and Technology Metals Foundation STEM Spotlight Series, where we're hearing from the top minds in STEM. My name is Yesenia Funes, and I'm the climate editor of Atmos Magazine. Chatting with me today are Terry Adams and Lonnie Thompson. Dr. Terry Adams is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology at Howard University. She currently serves as Dean of Research in the Graduate School and the Interim Director of the NOAA Cooperative Science Center in Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology at Howard University. Dr. Adams' research takes an interdisciplinary approach to examine issues that have both theoretical and practical implications. Dr. Adams is the author of Policing and Natural Disasters, Stress, Resilience, and the Challenges of Emergency Management which takes a critical review of the challenges faced by first responders before, during, and after natural disasters. Lonnie G. Thompson is a distinguished university professor in the School of Earth Sciences and a research scientist in the Bird Polar Research Center at Ohio State University. His research has propelled the field of ice core paleoclimatology out of the polar regions to the highest tropical and subtropical ice fields. Dr. Thompson is a recipient of the National Medal of Science for his work in climate science, and his research has resulted in major revisions in the field of paleoclimatology in particular, by demonstrating how tropical regions have undergone significant climate variability, countering an earlier view that higher altitudes dominate climate change. So with all of that, I um, wanted to just jump right into this discussion. So I'll kick off uh, with this question for you all. Whoever wants to jump in first can go ahead, but curious why you all do this work and what the inspiration is behind uh, this work that is at the intersection of climate and health. Well, I do this work because it has to be done. And um, it, you know, climate is the issue of our, all of our generations um, from, you know, 30 years ago up to through today and, and moving forward, if we don't get this right, then nothing else really matters, right? Um, from, from, from my perspective. Uh, what incentivized me to really get involved was uh, actually Hurricane Katrina and looking at the aftermath of Katrina on black and brown communities. Um, you know, I was just amazed that something like that could happen in this country. And so it kind of propelled me to to look at issues related to um, severe weather and climate and how it impacts our uh, communities of, of color and, and disadvantaged communities. Well, uh, for me, I, I actually came to Ohio State many years ago to study cold geology. Having grown up in West Virginia, I was looking for training for a job. And it, when I came here, my first uh, quarter, I was offered a position in what was the Institute of Polar Studies to study ice. And at the time, I remember thinking, I just didn't see how anyone could make a living looking at ice. And uh, on my, when I was a master's student, I had an opportunity to go to Antarctica. And there I saw just how much ice there is. Here's a continent bigger than the US and Mexico covered with ice. And uh, so I became very interested in what we could get from what's recorded in the ice. Uh, and so uh, we've been studying ice cores ever since. Uh, we started in the polar regions and, and we've been very fortunate now to have drilled in 16 different countries uh, and to work with people from uh, all walks of life. And, and to me, that's working in different cultures and, and, uh, uh, and understanding uh, on a global scale uh, some of the big issues and how we might work together to solve some of these to me, it's extremely important. What are some of the challenges that you all have faced um, on the field? How did you manage to overcome those challenges? Okay, well, I, I would say that my, my biggest challenge was when I, I, I was very fortunate to start uh, when ice core drilling and the, all the pioneers in this field were alive. But all that work was focused in the polar regions in Greenland and Antarctica. And when uh, uh, I did my dissertation. I actually compared the climate record from the very first ice core drilled from Greenland at Camp Century with the very first ice core from Bird Station in Antarctica. And it was at that time I became convinced that we needed something in between to connect these distant parts of the world. And I, I remember taking a set of uh, aerial photos of a tropical glacier, the Kalkaya ice cap in the Andes of Peru 
to the program manager in Polar Programs and mm. uh, asking uh, about would it be possible to uh, to conduct work at 14 degrees south of the equator. And the program manager listened, and when I finished, he looked at me and said, you know, Lonnie, that sounds like it could be very important, but I can't fund it because it's not north of the Arctic Circle and it's not south of the Antarctic Circle. And that was the only agency that funded that type of research at the time. So I went to Antarctica in the winter of 73, 74, and it was at Bird Station, and I got a telex from the program manager and it simply said, I have funded all of my real science projects and I have $7,000 left. What could you do on that tropical glacier for $7,000? Mm -hmm. And I tell X back and I said, I think we could get there. And the next summer we made our first trip to this uh, tropical ice cap. And that became, uh, started almost a decade of trial and error uh, before we finally succeeded in drilling it and that launched our whole global research program. It was a great record and no one thought it would be possible to get it out of such a high elevation, such a remote part of the world. Amazing, how about you, Terry? I would say in terms of um, the work that I've done with first responders, one of the biggest challenges has been to uh, get the people that you wanna study to trust you. Um, mm -hmm. because often when you're coming in as to do research, you're viewed as an outsider. So um, gaining their trust is really important and figuring out ways to make that happen and connect with them in a way where they start to trust you and let you in has been pivotal to, to some of the, the data that I've been able to collect with my students and I over the years, um, looking at various uh, first responder groups, both in the U.S. and, and in international sites. And what I found is once you, once people get a sense that you're really interested in their stories, then they're more apt to open up and really kind of let you in. And so um, while it has been challenging, I, I finding and figuring that out and just looking at it, the interaction, not just as a researcher trying to get the data, but as a human being trying to connect with other human beings has been able to um, bridge the gap and resolve those challenges. Um, Terry, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit more about your research because I think it's fascinating this intersection that you look at um, extreme weather, emergency management, gender studies, and the impact of trauma as well. How did you wind up in this field looking at this really specific intersection, which feels incredibly relevant with the growing urgency of the climate crisis um, and the impact it's already having on communities, especially those first responders. Right. Uh, well, I started out as a, uh, I'm a trained sociologist, but when I first came to Howard University, I was uh, given the task of actually uh, teaching just criminal justice courses. So most of my work was in that area, but uh, Katrina happened early in my career. And that, as I mentioned earlier, just kind of took my frame of reference to a different place. So I was just wanted to figure out why did that happen in terms of people being stranded in the streets of New Orleans and, and um, you know, black and brown bodies just trying to make their way to safety. And, and, and in that, I discovered that emergency management piece is an important component. And so I picked up emergency management. Um, also, uh, learning and understanding first responder communities and their needs, and then that became a part of it. And then through the research, I discovered that there are, that these kinds of events, disasters, um, and other high consequence events, they cause trauma. Mm -hmm. And they're both short and long-term impacts of the disasters and the crises on uh, people and organizations. And so that just became a part of it. And as a, as a woman of color, of course, I'm, I'm interested in both gender and racial dynamics. So that, that's just a natural interplay for me in looking at various issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of just like the urgency of this issue, right, um, Lonnie, how do you balance uh, that urgency around the research um, with ethical research practices, right? Because you've done research around ice glaciers, 
including some that are culturally significant to indigenous communities in Papua New Guinea. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, the first thing I would say is that uh, glaciers by most indigenous people are considered sacred places. These are places where either their gods or their ancestors live. And you know, when we come in as outsiders, we bring in six tons of equipment and drills. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a whole team of people coming into these areas. And so it's a, it, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, and I think uh, what we've tried to do is to go, uh, I, I go into the country. Uh, first of all, we have to have permits from the governments. Uh, if, you know, when we drilled Kilimanjaro in Africa, we had to have 24 permits. But usually those permits don't really deal with local communities. And so I go in a year before, we, we make a special brochure about our project, what we're gonna do, why we're doing it, and we put it in English and into the local language so that we can pass those out. Um, I give lectures, talk about what we're gonna do and why we're gonna do it, and then give the community a chance to ask questions uh, about uh, their concerns about what we're about to do. And uh, then we go in the following year to do the major drilling effort. And so this gives us some time. And I think building this trust is so important uh, uh, with the local communities. And in fact, most of the projects we do, we could not do without the buy-in of the local people because they are they're so uh, important for the success of the project. But having said that, uh, it's, it, there is a balance because these glaciers are disappearing so rapidly. Mm-hmm. And from a science perspective, we want to capture that history before it's gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the loss of those glaciers, it's, it's not just the loss of the history, it's also a loss of a, a, an incredibly important water supply for the local people. I mean, those glaciers provide water in the dry season uh, they provide uh, during times of drought, and that water is for drinking, it's for irrigation, uh, it's for hydroelectric power further downstream. So the loss of these glaciers are having a tremendous impact on these indigenous people. And so it's a, it's a real challenge, uh, but I have always told my team, and we have conducted now 64 expeditions, that while we have a science mission, and that's what we want to accomplish, the most important thing is that we be invited back mm-hmm. and uh, back to that community. And I take great um, uh, honor in the fact that uh, the Kalkaya Ice Cap, since I first went there as a graduate student in 1974, I've gone back 25 times. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of a hero with the local community because this was such an isolated part of the world uh, when we started. And um, so it's uh, it's building that trust uh, that is so important. That's something you know, Terry Terry mentioned, and I and I, I really think growing up in West Virginia on a small farm has helped me to communicate better with uh, the un, I would say the underprivileged uh, part of communities. And so while I've had the honor to meet presidents uh, in the countries where I work. I've also had the honor to work with the local indigenous people. And uh, and I think we all have to work together if we are to solve uh, these major climate issues that we, we now face. 100%. And you know, you talked about the melting of these glaciers, right? And some of the rapid changes that are unfolding um, in different environments. Uh, one of the clearest ways I think that we see these changes, um, at least here in the US where we're all based is, is is extreme weather, right? Um, Terry, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about the way that extreme weather affects community health, especially mental health, which um, I think is finally getting more attention as it relates to climate change. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, extreme weather um, impacts community health in terms of, you know, if it's a one-time event and it's something that happens or there's a threat and then there's not a serious impact on the community, then there was a threat that happened, the tensions are high, but then things go back to normal. But if you have an event 
and it's a high consequence event, meaning that that uh, there's a tornado or a hurricane and there's some level of devastation or the event can be uh, characterized as a disaster, then they're both short and long term um, mental health consequences. In the short term, tensions are high, people are trying to come to grips with the new reality. And then at over time, people settle into the new normal, if you will, kind of like we all have experienced with COVID, right? Uh, we've been in the, under these conditions for uh, you know over a year now. And for, for, for many of us, we've um, been able to settle down into some sense of normalcy. You, you know you're not doing the normal things that you used to do. But when there's a sustained impact, meaning that life doesn't just go back to normal, um, if you take the situation that happened during Hurricane Katrina, where it took months um, for some parts of the city to be uh, rebuilt or for um, displaced persons to come back and to settle back into a life. For some, it took, took years before that actually happened. There was a, during the course of the time, people are under extreme stress. And I think that there's a lot of talk about um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And we we know what many of us know what it is and, and how your body and your mind reacts to it. But there are other stressors that happen that not, aren't necessarily, can't be characterized as post-traumatic stress, but it, it's still a high level of stress. And it unfortunately almost becomes your, your, your norm over a period of time. And that has both emotional impacts on you as well as health impacts. So, it's like the stress impacts you both emotionally as well as your your physical your physical health. This book I've just read, Disasterology, by Dr. Samantha Montano. She describes Hurricane Katrina in particular as a catastrophe, which is like a whole other level, right, of natural disaster and a natural, or rather, an emergency. Um, and I mean, I'm curious to hear you talk about, um, I guess, the catastrophic nature of how disasters are transforming, right? It seems like we're entering a new, a new level of um, emergency, uh, especially after the IPCC report laid out some pretty dire scenarios of what we can expect. Um, is that something that you, that you use in your research, this characterization of catastrophe versus, I guess, like a regular disaster? Yeah, so I'd not necessarily discuss it as a catastrophe, but that Hurricane Katrina's example is exactly what that was. So you had this confluence of a natural disaster um, with the social uh, and emergency response systems that failed. And so with the emergence of those two together, you had a catastrophe. And it was a disaster of epic proportions in that it just jolted people out of the a sense of normalcy. You can imagine being in a place where, you know, the whole city, 80% of the city is, is under flood war. Right. I mean, I talked to officers um, and other first responders who talked about how it just messed with their cognitive consistency, even though they're used to dealing with emergency response issues, it just shook you out of your sense of normalcy. And, and being inundated with that day in, day out, and not having any breaks um, would cause trauma to a, a number of people, right? So as a first responder, as a police officer, or uh, a firefighter, or even an emergency uh, 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 medical health person, you're used to kind of gearing up to, to deal with an issue you're confronting it, you're moving full through it, and then there's this aftermath, right? It's kind of over. But if you can imagine this series of days in, day out, that you're constantly on call, kind of like our, med our medical health folks are and are been dealing with during COVID. Yeah. They're constantly like working long hours, they're constantly seeing ill patients. These folks are, are under a tremendous amount of stress. Um, Hope I'm answering your question here. <laughs> um, yes, no, I, I guess I just wanted to hear a little bit more about, about I guess, the, the extre extremity, right? The, how extreme these right. situations um, are becoming. And I, and yes. I think that Katrina is like such um, an important example of, of what happens when, when we don't respond, right, adequately, as you, as you mentioned. Right, and, and I think the thing is, is that 
because of climate change that what we used to see, like what are, what are they, what's the saying? One in a hundred year storms, we're going to see them more often. Mm -hmm. So as a society, we have to be able to adjust, adapt. Um, we have to have systems in place that are going to be responsive. And we have to be responsible as citizens of the earth to do all that we can to make sure that we can, um, well, they say it's too late to stop climate change or to reverse things. And, and I'll let Lonnie talk about that. But um, I think it's important for all of us to do all that we can so that we can minimize the impacts and prepare ourselves as individuals and be alert, know um, what the weather warnings are, know what are the proper course of action to take so that we aren't kind of left wondering what to do when these events um, occur. Lonnie, I would love for you to respond to that around, I mean, is it too late? Uh, I think that there's like some debate, right, depending who you ask um, on that question, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that, especially when we think of uh, the impacts that these events and that the climate crisis at large has on health, right? And what is it, what can the science tell us about this? Well, I, I, I can tell you from a personal perspective, I. Uh, first really became concerned about climate change in the early 1990s when I started observing melting occurring at the summit of that tropical ice cap that I visited in 1974. <clears throat> and as a result of that, I and a number of paleoclimatologists uh, testified before the U.S. Senate in 1992 mm. on what we were seeing happening in these extreme parts of the world that we were very, very concerned about. And it's amazing to look at where we are now and how these things have come true uh, even faster than we had predicted. Um, I, you know, I, the thing that uh, concerns me is that, uh, you know, the rate at which we're losing ice, that now it's not just mountain glaciers, it's the polar glaciers yeah. around Greenland and Antarctica uh, and all that ice is just water that goes in the oceans and drives sea level higher and higher, which makes impacts of storms like Katrina even worse. Um, and they, uh, the feedbacks that are in the system. And one of the things that really struck me is that since 1992, we have added an additional 2.5 billion people to the planet, hmm. all of which need energy, all of which need resources. And so we're pushing the system in so many ways that, um, uh, I, I, I would say that that the difference is, and I, I try to be optimistic about these things, is that uh, 20 years ago when I testified, we talked about climate change as something in the future. Mm. And uh, it's no longer the case. Climate change is here and now, and people are seeing it almost every night on, on the news. Uh, these just horrendous events that are occurring. And uh, and, the, and the trauma related to that, and, and Terry's absolutely right. You think about all those firefighters out West who never get a break these days. Uh, uh, the stress that they, they and their families are under uh, uh, from those actions, and even in these remote parts of the world, down in, in Peru, where this Calcaya ice cap exists, uh, lakes have formed since I started working there. These lakes are huge. They cover 84 acres. They're over 200 feet deep. And the people, local people, are now being impacted because if there is an avalanche off the ice cap, it falls into a lake and it creates a mini tsunami and it drowns their alpaca along the stream. And it ha often happens at night. And the people, uh, some of them are, you know, they're really stressed out uh, about these events because it's nothing that they're doing in their environment. They didn't even know these lakes were forming. And, but yet they're bearing the consequences. And some of them have moved out of those areas into towns and they have nightmares about these events. So yes, we are, I think that a lot of people in the US are now having nightmares of these extreme events that we're, we're facing, but it affects all parts of our planet and all these, uh, the people that live on this planet with us are being equally uh, impacted. Yeah, and that point you said around um, 
these individuals having nothing to do with the impacts or like they're not they're, they're not the ones uh causing uh these lakes to form and for these glaciers to to drop into um, nearby streams and such it also just reminds me of course many of these rural communities globally have also done very little to create the climate crisis at large right in terms of emissions and um, the industrialization and uh, uh, sort of consumption in their daily lives, um, which I just felt was important to, to mention in that context as well. Well, it, it, it is extremely important. I mean, it's hard for us to visualize communities that are above the tree line. The only form of income for them and their family is, are their alpacas. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they die, you know, they have nothing. They, they can't trade the fur. They can't trade the meat for food uh, that they get from the lower elevations. So they are being uh, adversely impacted and they have very few resources to bring to bear to overcome uh, those impacts. So, mm -hmm. so I think we have to be very much aware that many parts of our communities here in the U.S. Uh, as well as around the world, it's always the poor that get impacted first and bear the brunt of these changes. And within the climate science field, Lonnie, how do you see issues around health becoming more urgent? I'm curious if there is any like expansion or growing interest in that intersection because climate science, I think, typically focuses right on these sort of uh, far away um, ecosystems or environments such as like the glaciers that you study. I'm curious how health um, may be coming into the mix now too. I think this is a very important part of it. And you can think of it as there's two, two ways that health is impacted. One is the immediate, uh, the extreme events, the droughts, the floods. Uh, these are uh, hurricanes. Uh, the, uh, then there's the longer term. It's uh, this progressive rise in sea level. You know, the fact that Miami streets get flooded during high tide, uh, you know, without any storms. Mm -hmm. And it means that when the storms do come, they're going to be uh, uh, they're going to be stronger because the oceans are warmer, but the sea level is also higher. So the storm surges are going to do more and more damage uh, to our coastal areas. And to me, uh, we we often forget that you know we we settled this planet in sailing ships, and, and therefore some of our over fifty percent of our largest cities are actually coastal cities. And they're at risk with uh, rising sea level. And then when I actually see what's happening to the glaciers and the mountains where I study the acceleration, I see what's happening now along the margins of Greenland. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, it, it rained on the summit of Greenland, up a uh, you know, place that, you know, this doesn't happen. Yes, uh, I saw that, that news. That was the first time I reported history, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's correct. And they... But you see this, uh, the floods in Tennessee, I mean, you know, 17 inches in uh, 24 hours. I mean, I mean the, the devastation that comes from that, you know, that changes your whole perspective. But I've, I've been actually hanging out with some behavior analysts, people who study us, because I, you know, the science to me, the climate science is very clear. The reaction of human beings to science is another thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought that, uh, one of the things that struck me about the founders of behavior analysts was that uh, he, there were two characteristics he pointed out about people that we we may be concerned about 100 million people being displaced in Bangladesh by rising sea level, but we are more concerned when our house goes into the river. Uh, you know, it's the distant versus the, your family uh, and. That's what brings it home. And um, they uh, and we're very much here and now people. Uh, you talk about something happening 20 years down the road, 50 years. But no, now climate change is happening now. And the good part of that is as a species, we we t tend to be at our best uh, when we are, are faced with a problem and we have no other choice except to deal with that problem. And I think with climate change, unfortunately, it's come to the place where we have to deal with it. We, we really no longer have a choice. 
And so you asked me about what I think about the going forward. Uh, well, I think it's too late for our mountain glaciers. Uh, the problem is there's a 25, 30 year lag in our climate system. It'll be another 25 or 30 years before we see the full impact of what we've already done. And unfortunately, most of these four glaciers will disappear. Uh, I don't think it's too late for us. I think that we can uh, mitigate, reduce the impacts going forward. And in fact, we, we have to. We have no other choice. And um, one of the things that uh, I take, uh, um, it gives me optimism for the future, is our field programs are international. We work in extreme environments and we just had a project in far western China, western Kunlun's, and we had Americans, we had Chinese, we had Russians, we had South Americans, we had Tibetans, and we're 60 people on this expedition, and we're all working together in this extreme environment, and we succeed because we have a common goal. And I think for climate change, we don't have to have the same cultures. We don't have to have the same belief system. But we do have to realize that we are facing something that is going to adversely impact all of humanity. And we have to work together. We have to build bridges between countries and between people in order to uh, have a successful outcome of this. Definitely. You know, I'm curious because I, the, the topic of cultures and worldviews, um, I think, is an important one, right, when we talk about science in particular. Um, especially given how historically uh, the predominant uh, culture and worldview that has been a part of science has been uh, a white sort of, you know, Eurocentric worldview. I'm curious to hear from you, Terry, on this, um, on the barriers that exist currently in welcoming diverse candidates in the field and how we can change that, right? Because we know that we do have to work together for going to adequately address the climate crisis, which means having more varying um, experiences and um, worldviews within the science as well. I think it's kind of like Lonnie said, it's, it's now or never um, for us as a, as a society, just globally. And I think um, while there are still barriers, uh, you know, both for um, various racial and ethnic groups, as well as um, gender barriers are in place, I think um, many in the science um, sciences are starting to realize that we need everybody at the table to deal with this issue. And so that means we have to cut across um, cultural barriers. We have to cut, we have to put down our biases and our sense of, you know, this is just ours and we want to cling on to it. Um, I think we need to do more work in that area um, to allow more people in. But I think that that the alarm has been rung and that people are more aware of the, that if we don't get ourselves together, you know, globally, um, you know, we won't have the privilege of sitting around debating or talking about it anymore, right? Um, and that I, I, I think for many, and th this is actually, I think what I think we need to do more of is, is explain to people who are just concerned about the dollars and cents of things how climate does impact the economy and the bottom line for some people um i think we will get more people on board for actually um making those hard decisions to actually address um and and um address the climate issues but going back to your original question um i, I haven't forgotten about that um there are still barriers that are in place, but I, I do think, and I, I'm hopeful that those barriers will be continue to be to be knocked down. Um, I know at one time I, I would find myself as maybe one of the only women of color in a room full of people talking about, um, you know, emergency management and issues related to disasters. But more and more, I'm starting to see more people um, that look like me in the room. It's still predominantly. Um, white male field, uh, but I, I am I encouraged by seeing an increasing diversity in, in the field that I'm in. And this moment that we're in, this, this is the question for both of you, but you know, the sort of 
uh, moment that we've entered, right? Where, as um, Lonnie explained, like the climate crisis is no longer a matter of the future, it's here. Um, we're seeing, we're, we've entered this moment where the climate crisis has arrived, while also being in this moment now, um, you know, which clearly kicked off last year um, around uh, diversity and uh, systemic racism. I'm curious to hear from you both, you know, what opportunities are presented in this moment right now that we've entered as a society for the STEM field? Um, what role do science, technology, engineering, and math play in combating these health concerns related to climate? Um, and what are the opportunities now that uh, I think society is ready to take the next step um, in elevating this issue and the people who can be a part of addressing it? I would say that one of the things that I find really needed in STEM is the, the teaching of our teachers, uh, mm. uh, the bringing, uh, educating them, bringing them up to where they're confident in teaching things like math and physics uh, to high schools. I mean, I grew up in a very poor part of West Virginia, and you know. When I went to college, I was very unprepared for what I faced. Uh, but I think part of it is educating our teachers so they can educate our young people in these in these areas. Uh, they uh, and, and clearly this is uh, a bigger issue for the underprivileged parts of our society. Here is the opportunity for young people. They. Uh, you know, the new jobs are in things like uh, engineering, uh, they're in social media, they're in technology, they're in uh, uh, math and physics and biomedical fields. Uh, uh, these, are, uh, these, these are the growth areas. And, you know, they estimate there'll be 9 billion new jobs in this area in 2022. And mm -hmm. so, we need to be preparing our young people for uh, making a difference. And, and certainly, you know, technology is part of the solution. We developed the very first ice core, solar driven ice core for drilling Kalkaya back in 1983, because none of the core of the drills that have been developed for Antarctica were light enough to get to such a high elevation. And, uh, you know, uh, and if you look at the cost of solar power, or megawatt hour in the last 10 years, it has dropped tremendously. And it's solar and wind is now uh, competitive, in some cases more competitive than our fossil fuels. But it's this engineering and this design that's gonna make the pave the way for the future. And, you know, I have, I have often uh, believed that, you know, we really have to have our fossil fuel companies that have lots of resources putting uh, having a mindset change, become energy companies of the future, not dependent on fossil fuels, because we, we have to move away from those and to more sustainable energy supplies. And, and we can do that, but it's going to take the STEM fields and, and our young people being adequately trained in those areas uh, so that they can be, uh, ha uh, have productive, meaningful lives in, in, in developing those areas. So, so it, uh, I think STEM is absolutely critical uh, uh, for our future. So I would just add to that, that I, I think that Lonnie is correct. And I, I would um, advocate for um, including other disciplines under the um, uh, concept of STEAM, um, because I think you can have the science and technology, but you still need to, you need the behavior analyst, um, you need the economist, you need everybody at the table really addressing this issue. So I think in, in terms of um, uh, how do we get the various fields to become more diverse or how do we invest, I think um, under this new administration, there's more investment um, being um, targeted towards addressing some of the gaps um, to provide people with more opportunities. And I think there needs to be a long range um, game plan as well as a short range game plan. Um, the long range game plan is really investing in um, you know, uh, elementary schools and junior high schools and high schools to really prepare people for colleges. Also expanding um, career development um, activities that take place at those levels because there would be probably more kids at 
interested in going to into various fields if they were aware of them because you mm. you can only be interested in what you have been exposed to so a lot of kids are, are aren't aware of these fields and how much fun it could be just thinking listening to Lonnie and, and his stories of his early um expeditions and I'm like wow I that would have been really something fun to do I'm sure a lot of kids hearing that story would think the same thing and could get interested in his field um, so I think we need to have more people tell their stories, more sharing of information at the um, grade school level so ki more kids can get interested in, in these fields. And I think that we need to really come to grips with the biases that are um, at our various institutions. I think we all need to really look deep within and realize just because I might look different, dress different, or maybe sound a little different, does not mean that I can't do the science. Does that mean that I'm not equal to you? And so I think it's important for us to be honest about those issues that are still there and work to address them so that we can um, just get down to the business of doing the science and, 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 and lifting, lifting the science up and lifting all societies up to, to where we're really addressing the issue of climate change on a level where we are seeing really um, major mitigation efforts taking place. Um, that are really going to ho hopefully um, make things better for for all of us. Yeah, the the point you made around sharing stories uh, really stuck with me as a as a storyteller. I think that that's something that um, is so crucial as well, right? Like communicating the critical science that you all do, and again, like sharing that information with, as you mentioned, the youth, so that they can feel inspired um, and motivated to to be a part of this work as well. You know, I'd like to close out with the final question for you both. Um, what what keeps you going? Because, you know, I, I'm only covering this stuff, though, you know, <laughs> I'm just like steeped in this all day, every day. Um, but it's hard. It's hard covering this news. Um, and I can't imagine actually being out on the field um, and, and witnessing this devastation firsthand, um, you know, whether that's the melting of these glaciers or uh, you know the look in a first responder's eyes when they speak to you about the traumas that they've experienced. What encourages you all to stay in the science despite the the alarming findings that you all encounter? I would say I just have a natural curiosity, um, and I just love research and I love listening to people's stories. So both when I work with first responders and citizens, I just kind of fall in love with the process. So um, that's really what keeps me going, actually, uh, just wanting to know more, wanting to learn more, um, wanting to be a part of the process of figuring out what, what do people need and being able to tell their stories in a way, hopefully, where people who are in um, leadership positions or, or positions of being able to affect policy can have a better understanding what happens to people who are actually being impacted by these issues, whether it be a local firefighter or a police officer or, you know, a mom and her kids and a, mm. you know, father who's, you know, taking care of elderly parent. Just, I, I think having the, the ability to conduct this work, to hear the stories and convey that information is something that I don't take lightly. I think I see it as a real blessing and that that's what pushes me beyond the the trauma and just being able to 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 continue on, if you will. And not that I'm traumatized, but there is first, what is it, what is it called? Primary, um, like you're the primary recipient of of trauma, and then the secondary is sometimes when you're just listening to or you're hearing it. So being able to kind of distance myself um psychologically or or emotionally from it, but still being there in, in fully present with the person I'm talking to is, is a technique that you have to use as, as a researcher that I'm able to do. And uh, hopefully I didn't go too far off of a tangent and answer your question, but um, that's really what keeps me motivated. I, I would say from, from my perspective, I often think like when I go back to Kalkaya and I watch it uh, retreat the margins, watch the lakes forming, it's, it's very similar to having, going to the hospital uh, to visit a terminally ill 
loved one. And there are studies that we are doing now on those, uh, on those ice cores. So we're looking at microbes. We're looking at the evolution of bacteria and viruses. We're looking mm -hmm. at fire history of the Amazon basin, measuring black carbon, things that I never, when I started my career, we could measure, never even thought of measuring. But I know that in the future, there won't be glaciers in these mountains. Uh, and it's very important to keep part of that uh, because it's an, it's a, like a treasure trove of our past uh, that it, it's being, being lost. And even if the climate changes sometime in the future and it gets colder, uh, a new record will be formed, but the, the past record will be, will be long gone. So part of it is preserving, but I can tell you that my daughter who actually works in victim services, at the, F, at the FBI, she, she's actually trained social scientists, so, uh, behavior analysts, uh, and she, uh, she told me probably 10 years ago, dad, one more ice core is not going to change the course that we're on. She said, you got to reach millions of people. Mm -hmm. And so I have been trying uh, to do that. Uh, and, you know, this year we, 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 I gave a TED talk on the subject of, of climate change. We have a documentary, a full length documentary coming out called Canary, uh, which is to inspire the next generation of young people. Uh, I mean, it, it, it tells the story about climate, but what we really want to do is inspire the next generation of scientists. Uh, you know, how do you get them, how do you get them excited about their world and, and understanding uh, the world? And so I think we all have a role to play and we have different ways to reach uh, people and if we all do our, 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 our best at beating that role, we can change the world. And so that's, uh, uh, we'll continue to try to do that. I love that. Um, the, this climate essayist whom I really admire, Mary Hegler, told me in an interview once, um, you were talking about individual actions, right? And what you can do to address the climate crisis. And she says, Instead of asking yourself, what can you do? Uh, ask yourself, what can, what can you do next? Um, because we each have so much that we can offer um, the, the movement, right? Uh, it can start off as you know, recycling or taking a bike ride, but then it can evolve to something even larger, such as the work that you two are doing um, in science and in educating and informing the public. So. Uh, I just wanted to share that with you all and, and thank you again for your time today and for your expertise on this really critical issue. Uh, we're entering a new era here and um, we're going to need as many young scientists to, to get on board and help transform the field even further. So thank you for your work. Uh, it's, it's much needed. 